Our speaker today is Robert Jamerson. He is a history PhD uh, here at KU, uh, specializing in East Central European his uh, history. Excuse me. Uh, he uh, originally received a, a FLAS uh, in order to come here, as well as a, a scholarship in history, uh, and uh, studied Czech language and culture uh, in Prague, if I remember correctly. Uh, but no. Okay. no. Uh, and then. Um, well, he's no stranger to us. He's, we've seen him quite frequently at Brown Bags. We uh, always appreciate it. And then he's also given his own presentation on a, uh, a, an essay that won the uh, Larry Essay Award a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, Thanks, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so my talk today is going to focus on the cities of Prague and Breslau, although in the period that I'll be discussing, it's called Wrocław, Polish Wrocław. Uh, these cities, by the outbreak of the Second World War, possess strong identities and imaginaries rooted in their particular built environments. Uh, in a previous work that I undertook at Iowa State University in 2013, I compared 38 travel narratives of these cities for two centuries from 1700 to 1910. Uh, Danish, Italian, German, French, British, and American travelers consistently described Prague as medieval and romantic despite its rapid urbanization and industrialization, and Breslau as industrial, dirty, and modern, despite its excellently preserved historic core. Now these views persisted across the genre of travel writing, despite the rapid changes in these cities that made the imaginaries less rooted in reality over time. So before I really begin in earnest, I have to thank both Maria Lise uh, for inviting me onto the Socialist Cities panel at ACS in November, where this work was originally presented, uh, and for pointing out how I could extend some of my 19th century research into the 20th century in Socialist Cities. And I have to thank Chris as well for providing part of the funding that allowed me to go to ACS in November. While Breslau and Prague shared a similar pattern of rapid development and urbanization before World War II, the gap between Prague and Breslau's outcomes in 1945 could scarcely have been different. Poles refashioned German Breslau, destroyed in the war, into an important provincial capital of a newly socialist country. Prague endured the war significantly intact. Yet Poles and Czechs would both choose to either sustain or resurrect the city's built environment as it had been before the war. Prague and Breslau were, I argue, sticky places whose residents often resisted socialist planners' efforts to edit and overwrite their definitive cityscapes, which were rooted in the pre-World War II past. Patterns in the built environment and the way inhabitants narrated the city, originating especially in the period of rapid urbanization and development in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, locked into place and tended to endure. In both rhetoric and practice, inhabitants of Breslau and Prague read their cities in a way that rebuked the narrative of socialist progress and the forward march of time. For residents then, the ideal form of Prague and Breslau was the city before World War II, a gulf that Czechs and Poles both looked across longingly. Their view of the past was nostalgic, yes, I argue, but also subversive. For most Soviet citizens in the mid-20th century, urbanization and modernity were ineluctably Bolshevik. Britons and Americans had continuously lived in a bourgeois urban modernity. Only in Central Europe in the mid-20th century did urbanites uneasily coexist in tension between the quickly crumbling panelaki of socialist modernity and the cherished monuments of a supposedly outmoded bourgeois past. And so when I talk about sticky imaginaries, one of the things that I want to point out is the way in which certain locations become key to understanding cities, both for inhabitants and for travelers who are coming outside of these cultures. Uh, so this is Charles Bridge, circa 1900. Here's Rita Hayworth visiting Charles Bridge on her, on her trip to Prague in 1946. And Charles Bridge 
roughly today, 2002, the recent past. It continues to be sort of the keystone for understanding and navigating uh, the tourist sites of Prague, the, the sites that you must see to understand Prague if you're an outsider, uh, despite the long passage of time. And despite, too, the fact that Prague is not just Charles Bridge and Pražský Hrad and the Staromnieské Namiesti, the old town, uh, the Malostrana, it's also urbanization, it's also industrialization. This is the neighborhood of Smichov, um, circa 1910, I believe. And you see modernity, you see trams, you see advertisements, you see a working class suburb of Prague. Because travelers are not interested in this, and because inhabitants of Prague are not interested in selling this to travelers, uh, this becomes a neglected or pushed aside aspect of those cities' history identity. And in Breslau, we see much the same pattern. This is a painting of Breslau commission in 1760, uh, shortly after it becomes incorporated into Prussia by Frederick the Great. And one of the things that I want to point out in images like this are the industry, the transportation, the visible commerce, the smokestacks that will emerge later on as we move into the industrial period. The focus even in postcards of new transportation, modernity, technology um, that you do not see uh, as prominently featured in postcards or images of Prague. So this is the Kaiserbrook around 1910 in Breslau. And even in more traditional postcards that are going to emerge in this period of Breslau, where Breslau is trying to promote its historic core, uh, which it has. Uh, it has famous old churches. It has a famous Rheineck marketplace, much like Prague has Staromnieska Namiesti. Uh, you are still seeing in the background the smokestacks of industry uh, and the plumes of smoke emerging from them. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see one, two, th at least three smokestacks there behind the Rheineck, just in the background. So even when they place the historic core of the city, uh, the romantic medieval core of the city of Breslau in the, for in the foreground, in the background you still have industry, you still have modernity. So in Breslau, in what will become post-war Wroclaw, we find, according to Gregor Thum, a city, quote, between dream and reality a question addressing its own past and future. If cities tell stories, then Breslau's is confused, as if the original author died in mid-sentence, replaced by a ghostwriter imitating her style. Uh, since Frederick the Great, as you can see, Breslau had been one of Germany's chief industrial centers. Now, post-1945, with the German expulsions, it was to be exclusively Polish. As one of Hitler's Festung, or fortress cities, the Red Army had virtually annihilated Breslau's built environment by the time of the city's surrender in May of 1945. Newly arrived Polish administrators and socialist planners, backed by the presence of the Red Army, had a virtual tabula rasa on which they could write a new Polish socialist city. Yet this is largely not what happened. Instead, Poles chose to reconstruct Breslau as the newly Polish Wrocław, but did so by meticulously and expensively piecing the German city together again. They had to examine postcards, preservationist photos, and old schematics that had survived the war. As Thum points out, they attempted to historically reconstruct their devastated city, which they had never known in its intact state. Now, occasionally this was just a facade. Socialist planners sometimes ensured that working class housing went up behind the walls of 19th century bourgeois apartments. However, the pre-war patterns of bourgeois German Breslau kept asserting themselves in post-war Poland. So we find that in the officially classless society of socialist Poland, the neighborhood of Biskupen was, as if to maintain the tradition of German times, settled predominantly by the same educated elites that had defined it before the war. Wrocław also witnessed a decidedly bizarre situation in the 1950s as the atheist and church battling Polish communists dedicated lavish sums that they really couldn't afford in the 50s to rebuilding the historic sacred space of Wrocław's churches. And what I have here is an image of the Rhineck or Market Square at the historic core of Breslau that I've been talking about. 
And this is a postcard image from the interwar period. Or I'm sorry, from around 1910, actually. And we can see in May of 1945 what the core of Breslau looks like. Um, it's utterly devastated and destroyed, much like Warsaw uh, was as well. But today, if you visit Froslov, you can see that they've made strenuous efforts, this was mostly in the 50s and 60s, and then following on from there, to reconstruct this into this, even extending to the same colors and the same apartments. As I said, they use postcards and preservationist photos to try to accomplish this reconstruction. So partly this was a practicality, because pre-war Poland was a more agrarian country than Germany. Now Poles expelled from Lwów flowed west, while movement from countryside to city accelerated. For planners, reconstructing Breslau was simpler than dreaming up an unimpeachably socialist Wrocław. Scarcity ruled material life, uh, and Breslau's city of ghosts the living inherited from the dead. Replacing Prussian or German buildings with authentically Polish ones posed an insuperable challenge to architects and planners. According to Thum, the vast majority of buildings that had existed in the core of Breslau were constructed after 1740. Planners and preservationists resurrected pre-war German Breslau, and its buildings and artifacts persisted subversively as an alternate way of life encoded in the physical world, beyond the censor's reach, a qualitative rebuke to socialist claims of progress. Wrocław's long-term identity as a socialist city was problematic, precisely because of the clear superiority of pre-war bourgeois German buildings and material goods. These goods called pan, pan, excuse me, I'm not a Polish speaker. Uh, these goods called panimietski uh, by the newly arrived Poles included everything from pots and pans to clothing, silverware, rugs, and tools. Wrocław was awash in them, and semi-tolerated black markets sprang up almost immediately. Because these objects were, for the most part, quite durable in comparison to socialist products, Panimieski, Thum points out, also became synonymous with quality. People did not want to give them up. On the contrary, they were happy in the socialist economy of scarcity to hold on to objects from the era before 1945. Pots and pans, like pre-war architecture, were impossible to censor. Indeed, the communists may not even have considered these ideologically threatening, although the widespread renaming of streets and replacement of monuments across East Central Europe may suggest otherwise. Nevertheless, for dissatisfied Poles, the artifacts of Wrocław's past undermined socialism's legitimacy, staked in part on delivering progress defined in material and technological terms. The struggle over memory and the availability of an alternate modernity encoded in architecture and artifacts defined Wrocław as a truly Central European city. Breslau and Prague were cities on the edge of forever, places of fractured time. Here, in the mid-20th century, was a longing to go back to the future, an escape from the socialist present into a cherished past. Now this was very different from truly socialist cities that were made up out of whole cloth, like Manigorsk or Novohuta, where living conditions were initially starkly primitive, and any subsequent improvements could be attributed to the progress of socialism. Catherine Lebeau described these places as not only implicit homage to Soviet civilization, but also glimpses of tomorrow's reality, a foretaste of what socialism would offer when fully achieved. But most socialist cities were not Novohuta and Magnitogorsk. They were existing urban palimpsests, like Breslau or Prague. Here, socialist planners faced a greater challenge inscribing ideology on the cityscape. Even in Novohuta, planners did not enjoy completely free reign. Earlier interwar and wartime traditions of urban planning, such as those represented by Eugeniusz Kwiatkowski, remained the dominant force even in the Stalinist context of the late 1940s and early 1950s. Now moving on 
I'm sorry, very quickly, this is an aerial view of a urban plan of Nova Huta uh, when it was being laid out initially. And one of the things that I want to call your attention to is the uniformity of the cityscape. Uh, not only the clear lines of sight and avenues, which was a common uh, theme in urban planning across Europe at the time, but also the uniformity of buildings in terms of their height and the ceremonial monumental space that's devoted in the center of the city. Uh, not only for socialist parades, May Day celebrations, uh, October, October Revolution celebrations, um, but also other purposes as well. And now I'll be moving on and talking about the Stalin Monument in Prague. So Prague is perhaps the exemplary case of the Central European city as a place of fractured and insensible time. The city's temporalities are as fickle as its geographies, Derek Sayer reminds us. Indeed, Prague inhabits a time outside time where it seems condemned to slumber, telescoping the past and the present. Certainly, this is what Angelo Maria Ripollino had in mind when he wrote Magic Prague. It accounts, too, for earlier travel accounts, consistent description of romantic and eternal Prague. Though the city, in fact, changed rapidly from German to Czech and medieval to modern, much as Gregor Samsa woke one morning as a gigantic insect. Much of Prague's cityscape, like Breslau's, was a 19th century bourgeois creation. A Sayer described the period from 1880 to 1930 as perhaps the most definitive. Only one of the 60 or so buildings lining the main square at the time Le Corbusier saw it in the interwar period predated the 19th century, and most had gone up during the previous 50 years, which was a nationalizing period for Prague and for Czechs. Rapid modernization and change were possible, indeed typical, for the late 19th and early 20th century Central European city. But World War II dramatically disrupted this dynamism, and Breslau and Prague settled into a curiously static and tenaciously sustained model cityscape, rooted in their pre-war identity and meaning by the mid-20th century. Now, one of the better stories of how uncertainty seems built into the very stones of Prague is Hanna Pichova's recent book, The Case of the Missing Statue. The Stalin monument that she refers to, which stood from 1955 to 1962 on the Letna Plain overlooking the Vltava River, is a case in point of Prague as a place of insensible time. Socialist ideology struggled to overcome the inhabitants' deep-rooted ideas of what Prague was and what it ought to be. Conceived as a present to the Soviet leader, construction did not even begin until well after his death. Constructed at a colossal cost, and Pikova estimates that its funds would have paid for 10,000 new automobiles in the 1950s, and laboriously built from solid granite to last through eternity, it was an embarrassment to the Czech Communist Party a year after its unveiling, when Khrushchev made his secret speech denouncing Stalin in 1956. The statue was demolished, again at substantial cost, only seven years after its unveiling. In the end, the Czechs, ever a practical people, turned the empty foundation of the vanished statue into a storage cellar for potatoes. In Prague, the landmarks would remain, Czech national markers like Charles Bridge, the Orloy, Prague Castle, and Václavské náměstí. The Stalin Monument, a substantial effort at reshaping the monumental landscape of the city, failed utterly. If, as James Donald put it, the past exists as the projection backwards of present concerns, then what were the present concerns that drove Czechs and Poles to embrace the pre-war city as the model? And what were the consequences of looking backward in this way? The politics of the period, especially World War II and the Stalinist era afterward, were fraught with political uncertainty and the growing sense, as Hungarians discovered in 1956, that their destinies were no longer their own. Material scarcity, the unappealing aesthetic of mass Panalak housing, and the often shoddy quality of goods and services made memories of the interwar city appealing to both Poles and Czechs. 
Now, this reality prompts an interesting interpretation of progress and time in Central European cities. A brighter future quite literally meant going back in time. So it is no accident that a rallying cry in 1989 for reformers was the return to Europe. In the Europe of reformers' dreams, both Breslau and Prague were part of a shared metropolitan network alongside London, Paris, and Milan. When Mikhail Gorbachev declared his hope of a common European home in an April 1987 speech in Prague, was he aware how easily its residents could picture that as a historical reality thwarted by Soviet interference? All they had to do was stroll down Parishisko Ulice, a Parisian-style boulevard once lined with haute couture shops. They could have glanced up the street on Parishisko Ulice at Letna Hill, where an empty plinth and a potato cellar were all that remained of the world's second largest Stalin monument. Now, in Prague at least, the Museum of Communism is just a tourist destination. Four decades of history safely contained in tourist guides next to the Museum of Sex Machines. Time magazine describes the Museum of Communism as a sad reminder of a nightmare, a fiction Czechs woke up from to resume living in history. Meanwhile, one of the major new additions to the Prague cityscape is the Tanchitsi Dum, the dancing house, sometimes called Fred and Ginger. Designed by Frank, by Frank Gehry and Vlado Milinic in uh, 1992 and completed in 1996, the building is an interesting structure, as I think you can see here. Uh, in its Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers nickname, it harkens back to the much mythologized and yearned for interwar period of the first Czechoslovak Republic, specifically the height of Astaire and Rogers' 10 film collaboration from 1933 to 1939. That last year marked not only the end of Fred and Ginger's dances, but the beginning of the mid 20th century Czech nightmare. Tanchitsi Dum, which new president Václav Havel vigorously promoted on Vltava embankment property neighboring his own, is the architectural embodiment of Central Europe's postmodern sense of fractured time. Now its glass and steel curves may gleam like the future, but it is conspicuous in a largely Romanesque, Baroque, and neoclassical setting. The message of Tanchitsi Dum seems to be that heading into the future necessitates a constant reaffirmation of particular cherished pasts rather than others which, despite being more recent, are best bridged over and forgotten. And that is what I have for you all today. Um, hopefully I've left enough time for questions. I think that I have. Um, so this is, I will preface before we go into questions by saying this is not my main line of research. Um, and there are certainly a lot of questions surrounding what do you mean by alternate modernity, for example, um, that I'm happy to, to spitball with you guys about. Uh, so please open the field up for questions. I have see my question, see my suggestion. Okay. Uh, uh, when I came to Wolzl for the first time in for a conference in 2011, it was a really remarkable, um, rather lavishly organized, and it was in one of the old houses on the Rinek on mm. the Market Square, which I'm not sure now that. It looked like it was preserved intact from the Renaissance era, and now it, yeah. I'm having my doubts. But anyway, it was a very generously organized conference, very beautiful. Uh, and the feeling I was that indeed in the, the way the city was uh, organized and uh, you know, put together in the post-war period, there was a lot of attempts by the uh, Polish community, many of which, especially I remember the intellectual elite where mm -hmm. we settled from Lviv, mm -hmm. which they lost, to create another city which has this gorgeous Renaissance era center on the market mm -hmm. square. And there are different things. I mean, obviously, there is a big river. There is Ostrov Tumski, the cathedral island, mm -hmm. which is 
you know, different from anything that Lviv has, but became a major destination mm -hmm. kind of place. But there is also, like Nazi era 30s architecture, there's a giant concert hall, I'm forgetting its name now, that looks very much like it. Speer's Berlin, Berlin. Yeah, the Jahr yeah. Hundert Hall or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. But uh, what uh, to me is one of the really fascinating uh, examples of the tangled situation around Wrocław is the series of crime novels by Marek Krajewski. Uh, mm -hmm. I really encourage you to have a look at them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the first one was called Precisely Death in Breslau. And Krajewski was born in 1966 and started writing these novels, so basically Chandler style, you know, classic noir crime mm -hmm. fiction set in uh, pre World War II Breslau. But it's a Polish writer mm -hmm. writing about this city and is trying to imbue it with new meanings. And okay. it's a series of five novels has been hugely successful, translated into many languages, including English. So Krajewski, K-R-A-J-E-W-S-K-I. And uh, the discourse around those books, and, you know, mm -hmm. and around Krajewski as a phenomenon, as to why is he doing this, what is he trying to accomplish in that series of books could be something that could uh, add an interesting extra dimension to your research. It would, thank you. Uh, because this is, as I said before, not my main area of research, of course, and it's, but it is a lot of, a lot of things that feed into this mm -hmm. uh, in terms of urban history, in terms of modernity, in terms of defining what Central Europe is and is not uh, intersect in this kind of project. And so it is something that I've continually kind of been feeding back some energy into when I can, and I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. And this is just fun yeah. crime fiction. It's, he writes well, yeah. so it could be you know, a combination of research and pleasure. Yeah. Perhaps. Thank you. Hmm. Other questions? What is your research? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> like you your asked. 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have been lucky enough to find a way to marry interests that I would have pursued anyway for free um, into a thing that I can do professionally, uh, which in this case is um, working on the history of the computerization process and computer user culture um, in the 1980s in Czechoslovakia. Uh, primarily because a lot of historians of technology have written about the Soviet efforts at computerization and some have written about East German efforts, but Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary have been pretty neglected. Uh, and the assumption among historians of technology, generally speaking, with the failure to computerize in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, has been, well, they were socialists and so they were going to fail because they just couldn't master you know, this advanced technology that Silicon Valley triumphed with. It's a much more complicated story and, and so... Uh, yeah, uh, they approached it in a different way. Uh, they had different constraints. They had different attitudes to what they wanted to do. And at the time, there was no orthodox mix of policies that a state knew, you know, this is a surefire way to approach this process because it was still unfolding. Uh, and computer user culture in under state socialism is really fascinating because it, in my experience, just anecdotally from people I've encountered in Czech Republic and Poland and Ukraine, has birthed a kind of technology use culture which is a lot more savvy about how to repair your own goods, how to write your own code, um, how to get around censorship on the internet. Um, it fosters a culture of software piracy that uh, a lot of Western copyright concerns uh, have conniption fits over, but it's uh, what emerges from, from the culture of the 80s into the 90s and today is really interesting. So. Yeah. Actually, uh, the Hungarians were the ones who developed this application that we use extensively in architecture called Revit, which is a BIM application. The really? Information man uh, management. And it was bought by Autodesk, which has AutoCAD and things right, like that. Right, right. So, I, mean, I don't think many people know that it was the, the Hungarians actually developed it. And yeah. they were very active in this computers even before, I think, the, the end of the Soviet period. 
if you could send me an email with that information, sure. I'd be really grateful. So I'm, I'm always looking for examples of technology transfer like that yeah. from east to west. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's outside the Chuck context, but it feeds into what I'm doing yeah. exactly. So, yeah. I'm not going to laugh at your period because the end is sort of, but yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. 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 So there's definitely a legacy of what's going on there in the 80s mm -hmm. and 90s to today, today. today in the, yeah. the technology industry, especially mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Eastern Ukraine and in Poland. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I didn't know that because I probably would have asked you to be on that panel. <laughs> 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 I remember thinking, oh yeah, I'm sure you can make it work. <laughs> uh, I actually, I actually became kind of a running joke on one of the panels at ACES because um, they were talking about technology transfer and how it's it's always west east, it's always west east, ah. and and one of the things I brought up was, well, what about Tetris? Because Tetris is a Soviet computer game that right. was, you know, has gone has been consistently durably popular in the West for decades now since the '80s, um, and they were like, oh think of Tetris as an example of technology transfer, but it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then I became Mr. Tetris for the remainder of that panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't remember my name, I was just Mr. I Mr. Tetris. And so, yeah. Well, I was really interested in your presentation about um, Breslau okay. and the complete destruction of the city mm -hmm. building. Um, it was basically a German city, even though by the Polish, by the new Polish leadership. And I'm wondering, you know, to, to what extent was the German style mm -hmm. that was there also a Polish style? Mm -hmm. that, so that, yes, of course, this particular city was very German and, mm -hmm. and, and not been Polish for three centuries. Mm -hmm. So most of the buildings were German. But were the buildings, the Polish style of buildings, that different mm -hmm. that they would see, that they would say, oh, well, we're going to specifically the German style and the Polish style, or mm. they're just saying, this is, these are, we're trying to recover what was destroyed in the war, and we're mm. just going to put back these good-looking buildings. Mm. That, so I'm wondering how much do they see it as German rather than Polish? I'm only going to be able to give you a half answer on this, so I, I apologize. Uh, and the half answer is, um, I frankly do not know enough about architect ar architectural history and the distinctions between what Polish pre-war styles would have been and German pre-war styles. Um, my suspicion is that you're correct that they're not that fundamentally dissimil dissimilar. What I'm more focused on here is, and I didn't explain this actually, I should probably add this in, it's not only that the city is sort of a blank slate because it's been destroyed in this way post-war, it's that even the rubble of the original buildings is then carted away to Warsaw to rebuild Warsaw, mm -hmm. because so they that's- They don't even have the rubble left. They don't even have the rubble, not even the original rubble. So when they're rebuilding it at considerable cost with scarce funds in the 50s and 60s, what they're rebuilding is not even part the shells of the buildings in some cases, they're building them completely from scratch based on the original photos. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm interested in sort of why, if you have this opportunity uh, in the 40s and 50s, to build a new socialist city in an area where, because it's it's in the recovered territories and it's closer to the West, and it could be kind of a showcase for a new Poland, a new socialist Poland, why that decision isn't isn't made? Because in other places where we're establishing brand new towns, uh, where there's not even the rubble of an existing city like Nova Huta, uh, we are building socialist cities, explicitly socialist cities. Um, so why that opportunity wasn't taken here, I think is an interesting question. And, Thum goes into a bit more detail about the specific decisions that were made at the time. Uh, but what it boils down to is uh, Poles had to negotiate this really tricky territory, like you were saying, of claiming this territory as legitimately Polish and not just, you know, gifted to them by the Soviet Union and originally German. It had to be authentically Polish. But as you, as you said, Breslau had not been Polish since the Middle Ages. It had been German uh, for, I think, almost 700 years. And so the buildings that were there just weren't Polish. I mean, even the styles would have been similar. They weren't Polish. But they had to claim that they were. And so it's an interesting question. I don't fully know how to answer it. But I'm interested sort of in why they don't take the opportunity to build a new socialist city on the ashes of the old German Breslau. Especially given the attitudes toward Germans. I'm more familiar with what happened on um, Soviet territory. Mm -hmm. 
of course, there were, there were cities that suffered very extensive damage there. And you know, the, the, one of the towns I know best is Northbrook, mm. which got, was, suffered very severe damage, maybe not quite as bad as that, but mm -hmm. very severe mm -hmm. damage. And they did rebuild what was basically late 18th, 19th century mm. city mm -hmm. um, on, on that side. Yeah. With, in the center, out of the periphery, you have you know the typical five-story the blocks buildings and yeah. such. But they were in the center. They rebuilt. They rebuilt this. But there's a sort of a curious narrative about that. that they, you know, they talk about the sort of ancient Novgorod, you know, with its, its cultural mm -hmm. leadership position, mm -hmm. world, and things like that. But the city they're rebuilding is not yeah. actually medieval Novgorod because. Yeah. The era of Catholic the Great, they completely, they so completely changed the cityscape that, in fact, even the streets aren't in the same places as they used mm. to be. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think that's curious too, because if they're rebuilding, if they're claiming to rebuild medieval Novgorod, that was a mercantile republic. That doesn't really mesh well with Bolshevik ideas of, you know. Yeah, there's yeah. that problem too. <laughs> <laughs> and mean, then, and then Tsarist Novgorod too, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because the historians of Novgorod sort of finesse that in the Soviet period since it was a dead end. Mm -hmm. it, it, with the uh, annexation of Novgorod by Muscovy, mm -hmm. like they rejoined the main path and they don't have to deal with that part of it anymore. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's the interesting thing is. I have this idea of if you're constantly surrounded, if you're a progger in the 50s and 60s, and you're constantly surrounded by uh, what you tend to think of as the, the key monumental architecture of Prague, and it all consistently points you back toward a time when it wasn't socialism, it was part of bourgeois Europe. Um, that sort of sort of quiet whispering of architecture to people in their ears all the time or just being around as a sort of um, environmental influence is kind of a fascinating idea to me because it seems like architecture can then be or buildings can then be uh, sort of subversive in a way. Mm -hmm. well, there's but, some other aspects that are sort of subversive as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about the buildings I've seen in Moscow that were put up after the war. Mm -hmm. And you know on the outside you know they the, these very blocky things. But they're all sorts of little things that harken back to the older ways of doing things. Um, sort of the style of the windows mm -hmm. sometimes strikes me as something that's an older style that they've just sort of mm -hmm. plugged into. And one of the things that I most noticed was the wallpaper. It's this, you know, sort of art wallpaper. <laughs> yeah, I, well, it's not even Art, art Nouveau. It's older than that. It's huh. going back to sort of palace wallpaper of, you know, the yeah. late late 18th, 19th century palaces, they would have these, you know, sort of prints on the wallpaper mm -hmm. that are very, mm -hmm. you know, these old-fashioned floral designs and these heavy velvet curtains mm -hmm. that are 19th century. And I would just look at this stuff and say, why? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. you're trying to make your space elegant. Mm -hmm. You're trying, you know, you're trying, you know, the way you do it is not by making it modern, mm -hmm. but making it Really mm -hmm. The thing is, I would argue is that uh, uh, both Art Nouveau and Constructivism uh, were considered suspect styles, so mm -hmm. way going back, you know, mm -hmm. in Stalinist architecture to yeah. neoclassical sort of imperial yeah. style things was a safer choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, the so-called cabbage patterns on wallpaper or stencils, sometimes painted over them peasant houses would be mm -hmm. that kind of an example. And I think uh, what you brought up uh, mm -hmm. with Novgorod actually dovetails very well with the Polish narrative of Wrocław because they go back to the Silesian castes and the mm -hmm. idea that there was a time in the early Middle Ages yep. that was part of the same the uh, country and uh, mm -hmm. therefore we have this strange sort of schizophrenia. We're claiming the early medieval narrative but yes, we are rebuilding the 19th, 30, 20th century city, mm -hmm. which is in a way different from Warsaw because Warsaw, they rebuilt the city center, mm -hmm. but they also did not quite rebuild how it was in the 30s. They mm -hmm. went back to the 18th century uh, paintings and rebuilt the houses of how they looked after the bastardization of the sort of Belle Epoque of late 19th century. And then, but then the city of Warsaw did not need 
claiming as authentically Polish. It was already understood in such sense, as opposed to Wrocław, where you needed that narrative. Another difference, I think, so, so to bring up is the fact that the wide use of German POW labor for housing construction in post-war years. That's, yeah. I'm not sure how widespread it was outside the Soviet Union, but certainly a lot of uh, residential buildings that look very Germanic in style went up in the late 40s, early 50s, which uh, is different from Stalinist sort of wedding cake mm -hmm. architecture, but there are these two-story apartment buildings. You find them, for instance, in Kiev on the left bank. There are mm -hmm. quite many of them hiding behind the high-rise buildings from the 60s and the 70s. In, uh, in Wrocław, at least, I can, I can say that's not the case uh, because the, the reconstruction that you see today uh, that takes place in the mid '50s and then forward. So uh, already no German people. Yeah, the Germans are gone. I think they dwindle to a couple thousand, and then they're gone by about 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're initially the specialists are kept. Um, in one case, uh, tram drivers are kept to train in their Polish Polish replacements on the actual German trams, the old German trams, rolling stock, and then they're expelled. Um, so, uh, at least in that part of Poland and Wrocław. The, the German labor gangs for reconstruction is not the case. It's, it's, it's Poles rebuilding in the 50s. In the Soviet Union, yeah, I think they probably would have more access to, to POW labor, but. I have a picture that they were rebuilding yeah. the Estonia theater after the war, and they said they were uh, German prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I, I would bring up is, one of the things I think is interesting is the Czechs will leap back across the gulf of time when it was state socialism from the 90s to the 30s, um, not just with Tanchitsi Doom, which I have here as sort of a case study or example, uh, but also with other things. So for example, uh, if you've been to Prague, one of the highlights of the, of the cityscape of the skyline is a TV tower in Zhishkov. Um, and you may say, well, that was built under socialism, and it was in the late 80s. Um, however, Czechs hated it uh, when it was built in the late 80s, and they called it, in fact, Yakoshuv Yakeshuv Prst, uh, Milos Yakesh's finger, right, uh, to the city, uh, that he extended to the city. And it wasn't really until the 90s, when I think it was Vaslav Cherny, uh, the, the Czech uh, sort of modern artist, had gone and decorated the tower with these, in my opinion, very creepy uh, babies crawling up it, um, that it becomes sort of a Czechified socialist monument, and now it's okay to be part of the city and be promoted as part of things that tourists should see um, and an appropriate part of the cityscape. In the 80s and early 90s, it was hated. Um, so just another thing to consider, too. I, I think it's interesting the ways in which I wonder which about if they hadn't taken the Stalin monument down, would they mm -hmm. have done something like that with that? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question because even after they took the, the monument down, it was too politically, it was too much of a political hot potato to figure out what to do to replace the monument, right? So they debated endlessly about what to do. It was a key place. It was a key monumental space. They figured they had to put something there, but they never did. And so they just left the plinth em empty uh, practically to the present day. I think they've had some temporary art installations since then in the 90s and forward. Why did they turn into a swimming pool like they did in <laughs> Right? <laughs> that might have worked. Um, <laughs> But they just, they left this empty plinth, uh, this, this, this really clear, like, empty tooth of a space, um, and stored potatoes in the cellar. And even though the Communist Party officially forbade discussion of, you know, sort of the embarrassing construction and then blowing up, in fact, the blowing up of the statue, although it was obvious to everyone in Prague, because it was this massive granite monument, uh, was officially secret and was not discussed in newspapers or, or media. Um, but despite being banned from discussing that history, Czechs just kept calling it Ustalina. Mm -hmm. So where are you going to meet me? Ustalina. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's, that's Stalin's place, yeah. you know. And, and uh, so even though it's an empty space, it's still Stalin, I guess, mm -hmm. for Czechs in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and they never have agreed on what to replace it with, so. But it is interesting that these sorts of naming mm -hmm. things 